name is Janet Warren. I'm president of the Canadian Scientific Christian Affiliation. CSCA is probably easier for sure. Okay, so briefly, the CSCA is an organization that encourages dialogue between faith and science. Um, in the last three years, we have had some support through a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, um, and the talk tonight is possible because of them. So let me uh, now introduce our speaker, Patrick Franklin. Um, Patrick has been around a lot, uh, especially in southern Ontario, and then he left, but he has returned again <laughs> after being homeless for a while. So he studied at uh, Laurier, did his um, MDiv at Tyndale, and I believe I first met him when he was an associate pastor at a church in Oakville, Chapel Church, some people may know. Um, he then uh, did his uh, PhD at uh, McMaster Divinity College uh, nearby, and I encountered him there again. I think he did a few other things in between, but he then um, worked at, uh, oh, he, he, his research areas are in ethics, faith and science, uh, ecclesiology, and uh, Bonhoeffer. Um, and he published his thesis uh, in a, a book form called Being Human Being Church. Yes. Uh, he was uh, out at uh, Providence uh, for about six years and has recently started as an associate professor at Tyndale Seminary in uh, Toronto, but has just moved into a house in Kitchener after being homeless for a few months. <laughs> so join me in uh, welcoming Patrick uh, to give his talk on science's mission enterprise. Um, so Today's, this is sort of an interesting event in a way, in that it's a, it's a public lecture, but it's also uh, an AGM event. And um, I'm, I'm by training a theologian with an interest in science. Uh, and in particular, I have a real heart for helping churches to uh, wrestle with issues related to science and faith, um, and to not put impediments in the way for young people who may go on to study. And uh, so I come to you as a theologian. And so I thought maybe I should bring a theological topic uh, because why would I, a theologian, come and talk about science to scientists? <laughs> that would seem a little bit odd, I think, in a way. Um, so I want to talk about this, this idea of science as a missional enterprise and um, as an opportunity for us to reflect on uh, what the mission of the CSCA might be or look like or how that happens on the ground. So the CSCA is a fellowship of scientists and those interested in science who want to understand how science should best interact with the life-giving Christian tradition. So I guess my question for tonight is, what's the CSCA's mission with respect to those who aren't part of the Christian tradition, who are outside of the faith? And how do we go about interacting with that? Sometimes you get the sense that um, some people are really passionate about mission and evangelism, others are are not quite as passionate about that, or maybe we need to kind of redefine what that looks like. So I want to kind of wrestle through a little bit with that tonight. And I think it's an opportune time to do that. We just had a huge expansion project, right, as the CSCA, where we went from a few chapters to 11 chapters. And now we're thinking about how do we sustain these chapters, right? How do these things actually take root um, and uh, become productive and grow in their settings? So um, I think it's a, something to, good that's good to wrestle with. Um, so how are we gonna how are we gonna do this? Is the mission of the CSCA to openly proselytize or evangelize? Uh, now this is a bit of a dated uh, film. Some of you might remember Steve Martin, Leap of Faith. He's a kind of a faith healer and a traveling evangelist. Um, I've had some interesting experiences with evangelism type events. Some of them good, some of them not so good. I remember one that wasn't so good years ago. It was at the University of Waterloo, uh, and it was an apologist who came to speak on the topic of evolution. Um, and he was quite against evolution, but it was the way in which he went about it. He was rude, he was dismissive of questions, kind of had this sense that he was a bit of a know-it-all. Uh, just wasn't a good experience for me. And I've met a number of other people that have had those kinds of experiences. Now I've had some good experiences too of speakers doing evangelistic types of things. And many of the events that we do host are kind of apologetic in nature for the CSCA. Maybe a bit gentler than that, I think. But in terms of building bridges and so forth. So are we here to openly proselytize or evangelize? Well, that might not always be appropriate, right? Depending on the setting and uh, how it is we're going about our task and our relationship with students and others, it may not always be appropriate. It might not tend to give science the integrity that it deserves. 
if, if evangelism is the only goal or the primary goal, then there sometimes becomes this tendency to treat whatever's not evangelism as sort of secondary in importance. Uh, the other issue with this is that the New Testament really doesn't place a lot of emphasis on evangelism. Um, my New Testament colleague in that Providence out, out in Manitoba, never tired of saying this, when you read the New Testament documents, there's very little emphasis on, on the outside world. It tends to be very much focused on the integrity of the church itself, which is kind of interesting. Now, all Christians are called to bear witness. That's not necessarily the same thing as all Christians being evangelists. And that's just an interesting thing to begin to think through. What does it mean to bear witness to the faith and to be ready to do that? Secondly, might it be more along the lines of an implicit witness, where we focus on good science and moral integrity? Right? So here we have Homer, Homer Simpson having a bit of a moral debate going on. Um, deciding how to be a good ethical person in the world, right? Is that what we're focusing on? Um, or maybe to, to theologize it a little bit more, something like what St. Francis of Assisi says, um, preach the gospel always, use words if necessary, right? Now, I think this is an interesting approach and, and probably one that many of us fall back on a lot. I think the one issue with it is that it may not do full justice to the New Testament call and emphasis upon bearing witness, uh, and doing that, not just with actions, but also with words. I mean, look at the ministry of Jesus himself. Um, granted, he wasn't all about words, but he said an awful lot, didn't he? Did a lot of teaching, a lot of speaking. And, um, and so we may be called to, to more than just sort of an implicit, you know, hope people sort of pick up on the fact that we are a Christian organization. Is the CSCA's work pre-evangelism? Well, I don't really like this term. I, I understand what it, what it means and what it's trying to affirm. I think the problem with it is that as a notion, it tends to belittle everything that isn't evangelism, right? Because everything else is pre. So everything else is sort of of secondary importance, however subtly that may be uh, held. And I think what sometimes has happened when we adopt a sort of pre-evangelism narrative is we've adopted a narrative where the redemption story in the Bible comes to take supremacy over the creation story. So I might depict it like this. We have creation and the great creation mandate where God calls humans to go forth and be his representatives, fill the earth, be stewards, uh, you know, help it to flourish and so on and so forth. But then the fall comes, right? So that stuff's kind of out the window now. Uh, everything's wrecked. And now we've got the redemption story, which is about getting us back on track, right? And getting people saved. And sometimes I think what happens, and, and maybe it's, it's not on purpose, but what happens is that redemption story, which is a very real story, don't undermine the importance of that, comes to, to dominate and suppress and almost replace the creation story. So then we get caught in these kind of dichotomies where we say, well, should we feed people or should we preach? Well, let's do both, but the feeding is pre-evangelism, right? Or something like that. And so this can tend to create some false dichotomies um, where evangelism is the only real end and everything else is just a means to that end. Kind of that idea where, you know, why rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic, right? The ship's going down, just focus on getting people in the lifeboats. Um, and so I think some false dichotomies begin to arise. Um, should we focus on discipleship or evangelism? Spirituality or justice? The sacred world or the secular world? Church or vocation, right, in the world? And all these things kind of crop up. And, and we sometimes feel that we're not doing a good enough job as Christians because we always are doing this pre-stuff and never get to the actual good thing that is evangelism. Now, I want to argue for maybe a better way um, by talking a little bit about missional theology as a way of kind of transcending that dichotomy uh, a way of having a mission and pursuing God's true ends, but in a way that's a little more holistic, perhaps. I'm going to start with a quick video that talks about what missional is about. Missional um, theory arises in the domain of ecclesiology or the study of the church. Uh, and so this is a video about the church, but I want to apply it kind of to our setting um, in the world of the university and science as well. So here we are. This is the missional church. Simple. In the past, churches have spent large amounts of resources to construct the most attractive places imaginable for the community in which they were situated. Great music, 
compelling teaching, and a host of programs designed to gather people together were the staple of such church communities. Anyone who wanted to come was welcome, and church members were encouraged to invite their friends and neighbors. Generally, people had a pleasant experience. The people who came and were cared for seemed relatively similar. Education, income, pastimes, race, struggles, and histories seemed to be almost identical. Eventually, someone asked the question, What about all the people who aren't like us, but who live around us? Why aren't they here too? In response, the church increased its marketing budget, direct mailing the community, taking out ads in local papers, buying radio time, releasing a fresh web page, and offering to host the world's greatest event. The church was determined to be the center of everything great that happened in the community. Church members began to rely on the church to do the work of conveying God's story in the world. If someone could be brought to an event, they could hear about Jesus from a professional teacher. Inviting people became synonymous with evangelism. The missional church, on the other hand, empowers its members to be the church in the community. The church trains, resources, encourages, and challenges its people to live out the good news in their community with those who would otherwise be suspicious of a church and its marketing effort. The church sends out its members to live among people unfamiliar with church customs, songs, and what it holds sacred, just like a foreign missionary. The missional church recognizes then that every believer embodies the life of the church in their neighborhood, in their school, or at their place of work, each one of them telling God's story in the context of compassionate and genuine relationships. Okay, so that's a quick intro. Now it gets a little bit more complicated than that. I want to back up a little bit and talk about the history of missional theology. And it begins with a guy named Leslie Newbegin, who's a missionary in India for something like 40 years. And they go to this this place that's very, very different than Britain, where he was from. And uh, they think, okay, we're going to, you know, convert people and we're going to, we're going to do something for the gospel, right? And they discover that it's it's a little more difficult than that. It's a very, very different culture. Um, People aren't coming to faith immediately. In fact, it takes a fair bit of time. Um, Very different kind of a worldview. Now, over time, as they form these relationships, as people do start to come to faith, a very curious thing begins to happen. And some of these new believers turn around and they look at the missionaries and they're reading their Bibles and they're looking at the missionaries and they're saying, we're seeing some different things here, right? We're not sure it says what you guys are saying it says. And there's this two-way dialogue that begins to happen. And Newbegin says, you know what? You're right. I haven't realized it, but we've been domesticating, westernizing the gospel. So this gets him thinking about the gospel and Western culture. And how it is that we have tended to domesticate the gospel according to the ideas, the values um, that our culture represents. And so he begins to think about this. He begins to write books like The Gospel in a Pluralist Society or Foolishness to the Greeks and several other books where he's trying to engage in a new discussion about what would it look like for a genuine encounter between the gospel and the West. And so others begin to think up, uh, think on this as well, picking up uh, on New Begins writings. And so the Gospel and Our Culture Network arises, first in the UK and then in uh, North America as well. And what they're really trying to think through is, is what does it look like to, to have a gospel and to have a church that's dedicated to the gospel in a society that's no longer Christian? So in a, in a specifically post-Christian, post-Christendom kind of setting. Now, this is very, very different. It's not a setting where you've sort of got a pre-Christian world and you go in and all the ideas are new. And you're not dealing with a kind of setting where people just assume Christian values anymore either. But almost like it's this idea where we've, yeah, we've been there, we've done that, we tried it, didn't work, let's move on. And that's a much more challenging place to be in some ways in terms of how to share the gospel message. So they begin to think about this, and there's a number of shifts they begin to talk about when you go from a Christendom culture, where the church is in the center and maintains power and privilege, to a post-Christendom culture where the church begins to find itself in a marginalized place, a place where it doesn't assume privilege, where it doesn't get to just determine whatever the rules and the laws are, Um, where you can't assume biblical literacy, where you can't assume a basic sort of Judeo-Christian framework. Uh, And I think in a place like Canada, this is even uh, more extreme because of immigration and and so on and so forth, uh, secularization uh, and other things like that. 
So what does this look like in, in a setting that is different? What does it mean to live out the Christian faith? And might this actually be an opportunity? Maybe it's not a bad thing that the church isn't all powerful. Maybe there's opportunity in the midst of that. Now, there have been different versions of missional thinking. Uh, there's kind of the reform tradition, which uh, many of the people in the Gospel or Culture Network are part of sort of mainstream or mainline reform kinds of churches. Uh, more recently, there's been kind of an Anabaptist version of it. People like Scott McKnight and David Fitch, uh, the Maceo Alliance uh, is an organization that uh, is sort of Anabaptist in its leanings. And then you have kind of neo-evangelical sorts of approaches like Ed Stetzer, um, who's still in a larger sort of church model. So I want to talk a little bit about this, this missional framework. And the first thing it assumes then is a post-Christendom setting. And again, that's different than a Christendom setting because what we used to do is we used to think that, well, yeah, people generally have these basic Judeo-Christian ideas. Um, the problem is that the church just has lost its, its relevancy. So we need to focus on how do we make the church relevant again? But in a post-Christendom setting, relevancy is the problem. Uh, total invisibility is the problem. You're dealing with multi-cultures, uh, multiple backgrounds. Um, people aren't sort of leafing through the Sunday paper and, and thinking, you know, I think I'll try a church today. Uh, it's just a very different kind of a setting. And so instead of thinking about how do we get people in the church doors, we find ourselves more and more in the place of where missionaries find themselves around the world in a setting that is not Christian. And how does that affect how we act? I think we need to adopt a revised framework. And so um, I think a good way of, of uh, going against that earlier one that I talked about where the redemption story comes to replace the creation story. Well, we have in scripture actually these, these three narratives and they're all important. We have creation. And that's, that's something that God never gives up on. You know, yes, there is evil in the world. Yes, things get disrupted and distorted, um, and we need redemption in Christ. But actually the third layer, which takes up and, and, um, and completes, in a sense, those other two stories, is the new creation story. And that means that there's continuity between the new creation and the original creation. It's not sort of just out with the old and in with something totally new. And so there's a broader framework that we're looking at with the new creation story. To come at this from a slightly different angle, um, we often hear of the narrative of the biblical story kind of going like this. First you have creation, which is depicted as a sort of idyllic state where everything's perfect and complete. And then we have a fall, right? And then we have redemption and then some kind of consummation or new creation. And we might depict that sort of like this graphically. So you have creation being this idyllic state. We have this Fall, often thought of as a historical kind of a fall, this period of fallenness, and then Christ comes to bring redemption. And then we're kind of back up to that, that original place of creation until Christ comes again in glory, right? To bring us up to the new creation, whatever that's going to look like, right? I've, I've wondered about a different narrative. And the person that's got me thinking about this is a theologian named David Kelsey uh, in his two-volume set on theological anthropology. And he just, he narrates this a little bit differently. All of the pieces are still in place, but the order is slightly different. He says that um, there are three things that God does. First, God acts to create everything that's not God. Okay? Secondly, God then acts to consummate and perfect and fulfill that which he's created. And then thirdly, when that gets off the rails, periodically or, or whenever, God acts to intervene, to reconcile, to redeem, to redirect, and to reorient creation back to its original trajectory. So instead of a, a sort of creation fall redemption narrative, what we have is a kind of state of fallenness, which is a, a detour from an original trajectory. So it might be depicted a little bit more like this, where we have creation, and there's always a telos, an endpoint, a goal to which God wants to move creation. And then in the midst of that, we have this distortion that takes place. And I like this because it can fit uh, a more sort of evolutionary picture of how creation works and God's sort of intended destiny for things. So God creating in sort of two stages in a sense. And it can also deal with either a historical fall or a more existential notion of fallenness. Um, either of those could fit in a model like this. And so... 
the goal of redemption is not to replace or to get away from what was before, but to set us back on track to the trajectory that God had us with in the beginning. I think another important way of thinking about missional ecclesiology is to think that we have to understand what does redemption look like in terms of bringing back to us to our full humanness, a state of human flourishing. Uh, and so in, in the book that I, that I wrote called Being Human, Being Church, which uh, Janet mentioned, that's something that I'm really thinking about. How does, how does, how does the church take part in um, the reorientation and redemption of our full humanness. So I think a missional view of the world has to take seriously three sets of kind of doctrinal concerns. First, the Trinity, and we're going to get into why that's important in a minute. Secondly, anthropology, theological anthropology. Because my sense is we keep messing around with our versions of doing church, swinging from this dichotomy to that one, or this polarity to that polarity, um, you know, outward versus inward, spirituality versus justice, all those dichotomies I talked about, ultimately because we're lacking a, a thoroughgoing, holistic theological anthropology in which all these things hang together. And then missiology, the doctrine of what's God up to, what's his mission, and how does the church fit into that? How do we fit into that as members of the church, but not necessarily professional pastors or something? How does all that work? What we're after is a holistic kind of a gospel, right? One that brings creation and redemption and new creation all together. As an example of this, Leslie Newbegin in his writing talked about how it's interesting that, you know, God could have um, arranged it in such a way that he went to every single person individually in order to draw them to faith. So this is when Newbegin's reflecting on, on election and God, how, how God sort of elects some to go to others and, and so on. He says, no, God could have done it that way, just, just spoken to everybody individually. But what God's actually elected to do <laughs> is to bring people to faith and then to send them to others. And in doing that, both the means and the end get attended to at the same time. The gospel is about reconciliation. So God could send us an individualistic message, but that doesn't reconcile us necessarily. It reconciles us to God, but not to each other. But if we are actually employed in the very mission itself, that in the sharing of the gospel, in that very act, reconciliation takes place, then there's a kind of coming together of means and ends, um, a more holistic kind of approach. Let me spend a bit of time speaking about some basic concepts in a missional understanding. First of all, this notion that mission isn't just a sideline topic, but it's a key feature of what the church is. And it's a key feature of what the people of God is. So when I say church, I don't just necessarily mean sort of the building or something like that, or the professional ministry, but, but the people of God, right? The people. And mission is a defining feature of what it means to be this people. In other words, being missional informs our identity as the people of God. Mission defines who we are, not just what we do, some of the time. I sometimes like to think of this in relation to becoming a dad. You know, many years ago, my, my oldest is 12 now, going on 13. Uh, and I remember those early days when I first became a dad, I suddenly inherited a whole bunch of new tasks, right? Getting up late at night, changing diapers, uh, doing dishes, you know, my exhausted wife, helping her out in various things. But it's not just, you know, it's dadness is not just a bunch of stuff to do. Um, it actually affects my identity. I, I am a dad. And this, this changes who I am, in a sense. It impacts me. And in the same way, mission is sort of the lifeblood to the people of God. It, it, it affects not just what we do, or what we do some of the time, but who we are, and who we are all of the time. So if we follow that up, then this idea that, that mission is just, it's not just a thing that's a sideline, it's actually pervasive in the story of the Bible couple of book recommendations, and I, there's lots of them out there, but Christopher Wright has written a book, he's a biblical scholar, written a book called The Mission of God, where he traces the theme of mission right from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and, and just brings alive how thoroughly uh, this is a story about God creating a place in which he's going to dwell with the people, and where that goes off the rails, and then he wants to reestablish this, and this is what the entire biblical narrative is about. Michael Gorman, a Pauline scholar, writes on participation and the gospel and mission. Just a couple of examples of just how pervasive this theme is. And so if that's true, then the identity that, that we receive as Christians is that we are missionaries. 
we're missionaries in our own land. Mission is not just something we do somewhere out there. Um, it's something that we do in our context, in our lives, in our neighborhoods, right? Our, our communities, our vocations. It's who we are, not just what we do. Now, there's a number of key texts I could point to, and I'm not going to go through all of these. It would take way too long, but I've, I've given them out to you so that you can sort of peruse them. I just want to point out a few of them, though, as we go. So this all begins with the calling of Abraham, uh, Genesis 22, where God says to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Now that's a promise that gets repeated something like five times in Genesis alone, in slightly different versions. And really interestingly, in Galatians 3 verse 8, Paul talks about Abraham having received the gospel in advance. I'm like, what? Like Abraham, what does this mean? He got a gospel track, something about Jesus and a cross and a big ditch. Uh, did he get a theory of the atonement? What was it that Abraham got? Well, Paul says... What Abraham got was this idea that through his seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the gospel he received. That's an incredible vision. We see Paul picking this up himself in places like the first chapter of Ephesians, the grand plan. So God making known the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach the fulfillment, to bring all unity to things in heaven and on earth, under one head, under Christ. It's actually the passage where we get the word recapitulation from, summing up all things under one head, uh, who is Christ. And then if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's got more of this grand vision. He says what God's up to in Ephesians 2 is, is he's taking this people, the Jews, and he's taking another people, the Gentiles, everybody else, and through Christ, he's making one new humanity. So that's kind of the big plan. And it goes from the early parts of the Bible all the way to the end. And I think this is, this is where, within that grand story, this is where we see the Great Commission coming into play. Uh, right? That we're, we're to go out and make disciples. Uh, and the Great Commandment, that we're to love God and love neighbor with all that we are. And all that we have with our whole being. A second key image or idea is missional theology depends on this notion of the Maseo Dei, or the mission of God. And there's a couple of ideas associated with this. First of all, that mission proceeds from God, the triune God. And this is wrapped up with the Trinitarian theology of sending. So the Father and the Son love each other by the Spirit. The Father loves the Son by the Spirit. The Spirit returns the love of the Father. I mean, the Son returns the love of the Father um, again through the Spirit. And then you get all of this interesting sending language. And so God is a, a God that sends. The Father sends the Son. And then the Father and the Son send the Spirit. Or the Father sends the Son through the Spirit uh, to the earth. And then Father, Son, and Spirit send the church. Uh, on this, this mission to do their work. Now, it's not just that we're sort of sent to, to do what God can't do anymore, but we're now participating in something that God himself is up to. So mission then about participating in God's mission, not simply devising our own mission, but participating by the Spirit in something that Jesus is doing. So there's some Trinitarian stuff uh, wrapped into that. There's some stuff around experiencing God, Many of you might remember a book written years ago by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. Uh, maybe not, but in this book, he, he argues that really what we should be on about as Christians is we need to have our eyes opened. We need to cultivate discernment so that we can learn to see where God is at work in the world and then join him in that. You know, rather than trying to devise the solutions always ourselves, uh, or maybe as churches, we come up with visions and we try to sell these visions to people, pull them out of their context so that they can serve the church. This is the idea that where's God at work? Where's he working by the spirit? And how do, we, how do we join in with that? And I think that's actually really key to this whole notion of missional and of being witnesses, because being a witness is about saying, sharing what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced, not selling a prepackaged message per se. Right? So experience of God becomes really important. And here we might speak of our identity as a royal priesthood. Those sent into the world to be representatives of Christ, to stand in the gap, so to speak. 
So we're this royal priesthood that's sent to declare God's praises. And there's some key texts that uh, we could point to here. I've listed some of them in the, uh, in the page there for you. Um, I just want to read one or two. Notice the sending language. John chapter 20. Jesus said to them, this is the risen Christ, peace be with you, he says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff just wrapped up into that one verse, right? Uh, Father, Son, Spirit is a Trinitarian verse. Um, we are sent by the power of God. And in our sending, crucial to that is the reception of the Spirit. Um, so long before we show up to do anything in terms of mission, God's Spirit is already at work, right? We're not having to sort of make it all happen on our own. I find that very encouraging. Again, John 15, when the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify. Isn't that interesting? So again, this is not salesmanship. This is actually just joining in with a voice that's already speaking, right? The voice of the Spirit, who himself is the, the great witness, the, the testimony, the testifier. And then I cited uh, 1 Peter uh, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. This is all of us, right? A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And I just wanted to pick up on the chosenness of this passage. Um, not because I'm going to talk about predestination or anything like that, uh, but just as a reminder that um, this is about what God is up to and us joining in with it, not us choosing a mission for ourselves. Thirdly, a missional theology is a kingdom-focused theology. It's not primarily about an institution, but about a people. And it's not about selling a product, right? It's about bearing witness to a kingdom. Uh, George Hunsberger, who's a missional writer, says that the church has got to stop thinking of itself as a vendor of religious goods and services. Um, fewer and fewer people are even interested in that. Uh, especially when it's just stuff that people already kind of have and we're just sort of dressing up with Christian language and selling back to them again. Instead of that, uh, the missional writers argue we're to be a sign and an instrument and a foretaste of the kingdom of God. So again, this is a, a kingdom-focused kind of a thing. And the identity that we pick up from this is that we become resident aliens, sort of colonies of the kingdom in the midst of the world. Some of the key texts I would point to would be especially texts in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says that you are salt, you are light, you are a city set on the hill. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer makes the interesting observation that Jesus doesn't tell them you have the salt, right? Or you have the light, like it's your message or it's your preaching or it's something you are doing. But you yourselves are the salt. You yourselves are the light. You yourselves have become a city set on the hill because God is at work in your midst. Also, we could point to many of the kingdom parables, um, which some of them are really interesting, right? It's, there's mystery in the kingdom. There's one where we worry so much about mission sometimes. And there's this one where, you know, this farmer basically puts some seed out and in the morning, bam, there's a field. It's like it happened automatically. And actually the Greek word sounds a lot like automatically. Um, so, so this idea, if we're being faithful, if we're seeking the kingdom on the, the stuff that's just integrity that matters to God, um, we become a sign and a foretaste of that which we are proclaiming. Uh, and that's something that can be a draw for people. Fourthly, there is a lot of discussion about being incarnational as opposed to being attractional. Part of this is getting against the kind of consumerist mentality that we've adopted as churches all too often, um, where we try to make church really exciting. And almost some of the times it's a bit like a bait and switch. Like if we can just get people in the door Maybe at some point we can teach them to be disciples, but that point never seems to come. The church is less and less effective, and even those that we bring in aren't getting discipled, and so we wonder what kind of the point is. So instead of that idea, instead of sort of, you know, me being the biggest circle, and then somehow I'm going to fit the church into my life, and then maybe the world if I get around to it someday, really I see myself as just a small part of a much larger story. You know, I am not the main actor of the show. <laughs> I'm a supporting character at best. Um, and yet there's great wonder in that because I'm drawn up into a story that's been going on for thousands of years. 
um, a project that God is doing, a trajectory where he wants to bring the world. Uh, Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch wrote a book called The Shaping of Things to Come, in which they're talking about uh, missional theology. And um, they use this diagram, which I think is helpful, where they, um, they say, we've got to think about this inter interaction between God and the church and the world. And if we begin here, if it's if sort of God and the church gets emphasized without the world, we end up with a non-missional spirituality, a kind of navel-gazing, uh, worship done in the abstract, a lot of Christian cliches thrown around, an irrelevant church expression, theology done in the abstract, just kind of rote doctrine that you're supposed to believe just because. Uh, if we locate it down here where it's church and world, but sort of outside of an active sort of living faith and relationship with God, we get a technique focused sort of religion. Uh, moralism, legalism can creep in. Uh, or a strong seeker-oriented theology that's all about winning people, but, but why is it that we're winning people again? What's the trajectory we were on? Where are we going with this? And then if we have God in the world, we tend to have you know, prevenient grace, common grace being emphasized. Um, but also we begin to not really be able to distinguish between Christianity and just pop spirituality sometimes. This kind of I can worship God anywhere sort of idea. Uh, and sometimes a pluralistic kind of theology. So they argue where we want to be is kind of in this, this kind of intersection, right? Where there's an incarnational engagement, where there's a missional discipleship, um, where God wants to do something first to us and only then through us, um, not have us sort of empty shells that are selling something that isn't real to us. Uh, a Trinitarian theology of participation and this notion that church is moving out into the peripheral places in society and not expecting people always to come to the church. So the identity here is, I think, to identify as the body of Christ in a very real way. This is about authentic life together. Um, mission, then, is not a duty. It's an, actually an overflow of what God is doing in the Christian community. Um, it's simply about being real. You know, actually being real in our relationships with one another, real about our faith, and sort of just living that kind of out loud. Bonhoeffer uh, talked about the church being the presence of God in the world. I'm sorry, the presence of Christ in the world, just as Christ is the presence of God. So Christ comes as the image of God, and then the church is there as Christ's body. And we're to point to this. And one of the ways we do that is by this, this strong sense of community that we live out, this common, authentic life together that's transformative. Um, and so the church should be attractive in a way, and Christians should be attractive without being attractional in a kind of consumerist sense. Some of the key texts here would be texts that emphasize the love of God. So just, just for one, a new command I give to you, love one another, right? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Martin Luther said, a Christian lives in... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get this wrong. I better quote it off my page. A Christian lives in God and in his neighbor or her neighbor. Um, Christian lives in God through faith, in the neighbor through love. Uh, and I think that's a really kind of neat phrase, Luther says. If, if we're not living in God and in labor, then we're not really Christian. And we live in God through faith and in the neighbor through love. And then finally, the church exists for others, not just for itself. And here's this notion where the church is not trying to build another Christendom. It's not operating in a sort of colonial mindset, but really it's moving into a position of servant, servitude. Uh, we're here to serve. We're not in a place of privilege, privilege anymore. Um, and we can't just have the, the, the wishful thinking where we hope that we'll be there again one day. Um, arguably, that wasn't really the place the church has had in Canada uh, for a long time. But we're still called to be faithful to the mission. Um, our identity then becomes being ambassadors in this place. Or servants living in exile. So one of the images that missional writers have picked up on is the image of Israel in exile. Um, and so Israel is, is taken out of their land. They're brought off to, to captivity in Babylon. And they're still called to be the people of God in that setting and to be faithful even though they have no control over how the laws of the land are going to work, they have no control over their influence in the world, and they're still called to be faithful there. 
I think one of the key texts for this one that's a great one is Jeremiah 29. You may have heard this read in this kind of a setting before. So this is a prophecy about what's going to happen as the Israelites are living in exile. And the instructions are interesting. Jeremiah says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, Settle down. It's going to be a while, he says. Build houses. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they too may have sons and daughters. So you're going to be here at least till you have grandkids, right? Um, Increase in number. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will too prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to their dreams. Um, They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So it sounds like they're in this situation where things are going to get bad. And some of the prophets are going to say, just hold on. The good old days are coming back any time now. And Jeremiah says, no, they're not. This is going to be a while. And your, your calling here is not to be successful, so to speak. Uh, it's to be faithful and to bear witness and to, to bear that integrity of being the people of God. Okay, so now what does all of this mean? And I don't have a lot of time left, but I want to start to think about what does all of this mean for being scientists and those interested in science or those operating in a university context? for science as a missional enterprise. I think one of the positive ways forward is if mission is about identity, who we are, not just what we do, then really what this centers us on is practices because it's practices that shape our character, shape who we are in the world. In other words, you become what you do. David Fitch writes in his book, Faithful Presence. Faithful Presence names the reality that God is present in the world and that God uses a people faithful to God's presence to make God concrete and real amid the world's struggles and pain. But it doesn't just happen. We need practices that shape us to be a community of faithful presence. So what kinds of practices might ensue for us? Now, I'm not just going to quote the book because this book's more about the church and it doesn't all apply to all of us out in the world necessarily. But I want to pick up on a few things and I think that there are some practices linked with each of these identity markers I've talked about. So if we are now missionaries, living in a post-Christian setting, you know, sort of like foreign missionaries in our own land, then we've got to really think through this framework, right? What does it mean without assuming it's just going to be like it was 50 years ago or whatever? What does it mean for the kingdom of God to take place or to become manifest in this place where I'm serving? How do I begin to envision all things in light of Christ, including my job? How do I live into my mission field? Uh, Gary Nelson, the president of Tyndale, uh, wrote a book called uh, Borderlands. And he distinguishes between what he calls mission projects and mission fields. And he says, it's mission field that makes you missional. So projects are important. You know, going to a soup kitchen, uh, you're holding a lecture event. Those are all important. But the difference between a project and a mission field is a mission field brings you into daily contact and relationship with those uh, that you're ministering to. So it's a long range kind of a vision and it brings you into ongoing relationships with people. And so do we recognize that we have a mission field? Do we know that field? Do we love it? You know, let's get the sense sometimes that missionaries that go away, they begin to love the land, right? They begin to be able to name it and know it really deeply. Do we love our land, right? Do we love the place that we're serving? Do we love the people around us? Uh, And does that affect how we live. So the practice then is to really dig into our place, our locality, and also to dig into relationships, because uh, that's where a lot of this begins to, to take place. Secondly, if our identity is to be a royal priesthood, then um, one of the things that passage in First Peter is doing in chapter two that calls us a royal priesthood is Peter is applying very sort of Jewish Israel language to Gentiles. And that's very, very curious. It's it's ethnic language that he's now applying to Gentiles. And one of the things he's doing to them is he's saying, you know how the story, you've been grafted into this people, and your story goes back thousands of years. 
And so there's a sense in which if, if we're going to be missional, if we're going to have a mission field, we need to have a sense of the story, where we've come from, where we're going. So are we immersed in the narrative? How does that narrative challenge the narratives of our world? Um, this is where we have a chance to, to, to be holy in our setting, to pursue uh, light. I think in the, the, um, the ASA meeting that we had in the summer uh, down in Boston, uh, one of the really memorable lectures was Francis Collins' lecture. Uh, for those of you who are there, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I think one of the things that inspired me most about Collins' lecture, I mean, yes, he's a genius, unless his knowledge is unbelievably ridiculous, right? Um, but actually what grabbed me was his sense of optimism and hope, the sense that he really cares about what he's doing, that he loves the people he's interacting with. Um, and also his call that, you know, we got to be in these places because if Christians aren't there, there's going to be a moral vacuum in some of these places. So we can do real good in all these places, genetics and, uh, you know, healthcare and so on and so forth. Uh, just a really inspiring kind of a message. Thirdly, this, this identity of being resident aliens or kingdom colonies, uh, we can engage in countercultural acts. So there, there is a way in which, as Christians, we are going into a setting. There's also a way in which we're called to be different. Um, Alan Planiga, some years ago, wrote an essay for young new philosophers. And you can Google it. It's, it's fantastic. And I find it speaks to me even in, in other fields. One of the things he said is, don't just always assume the predominant sort of theories in your field. You know, don't, don't be afraid to challenge things to be a little bit different in your setting. Uh, another good example of this is the sociologist Christian Smith. Uh, Well-respected, trained at Harvard, uh, teaches at Notre Dame. And he's been engaged in a project over the last, I don't know, decade or so of really challenging his own field and discipline to make sure it uh, attends to ontological questions. Because when sociologists want to go on to make ethical claims, and they really want to do that, it's hard to do that if, if you've got no ontology, if you have no sense of what a human person is or what purpose a human person might have, sense of telos. So he's been really pushing back in that domain, and he's got the credentials to do it. So sometimes we have to be countercultural and think about ways that we can, can do that in our own setting. So how does the gospel make us different in our setting? Uh, if we're the body of Christ, how are we living out life together? in our midst. When I think back to my university days and what really had an impact on me in terms of my Christian faith, it was the university group. And it wasn't necessarily a message I heard. And I remember other students coming from all kinds of domain. I remember this computer scientist guy who was just really bright and had all these questions. In the end for him, it wasn't an intellectual thing though. It was encountering the genuineness of Christian community that had a lasting impact on him. And I think this may be one of the primary places that we could be challenged as the CSCA, especially to make our new chapters flourish. How do we cultivate genuine Christian community and life together? Because again, people aren't just scientists, they're human beings, right? Uh, or they're not just students, they're human beings, and they need a place to belong, a place to share, a place to interact. And that takes all types. Some of us will be gatherers. We're the kind of people that like to invite others to community. Others are good hosts, right? And some just like doing tasks. I mean, we, we were part of a church plant out in Manitoba. I think one of the most memorable days was when we had a cord of wood and we all were just chopping wood together and just the relationships began to form. So there might be even things that we do together that aren't even about science at all, but actually do the work of bringing us into relationship where these deeper conversations can take place. And then finally, as ambassadors, how are we called to be reconcilers, to be peacemakers, to be bridge builders and networkers? How are we called to lift others up and make them shine? That can be a really countercultural thing to do, right, in an academic setting. It's not about me, it's about helping others to shine, helping bring them up, right? That's something I think that we can do. I've got a good friend who's um, served another number of companies as a CEO. And typically what he does is he goes into a company that's been struggling, turns it around, makes it profitable, um, and then kind of moves on and goes somewhere else. And one of the key things he does, and yes, he's, a, he's an engineer and he's got an MBA and he's got all this business smarts, but actually what he finds himself doing most of the time is helping people reconcile, <laughs> helping deal with toxic environments. And he really sees his mission as a business person not to seek profit, but to be a reconciler and a peacemaker as a CEO. 
I just find that really uh, inspiring. Okay, I'm going to close there now. Um, I don't have all the answers in terms of what this looks like for us, but I'm hoping to stimulate conversation. Uh, what does this look for you, like for you in your setting? Can our, our managers nations begin to expand a little bit? Um, if you're interested in some of the details behind this theology, there are some of the things that I've published on this topic. If you want a quick access point, you can go there. Um, but questions and response, I think we have a little bit of time for that. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was inspiring and challenging, but not in any dare this sort of manner. Um, yeah. So, questions? Questions, comments, reflections. If you've got stories, I'd love to hear them too. Yes. Sorry, just a comment. Thank you for uh, going back to this in the beginning. Um, I met him when he was an old man uh, in Birmingham after his time as the Bishop of South yeah. India. Uh, I've read the books you mentioned, but actually for me, the book that was liberating was his little book, The Other Side of 1984. Until I read that, I thought I was the only person in the Western world who did not believe in the Enlightenment. <laughs> and he said, me too. And he was fabulous. But he, he was a, a wonderful presence as an 80-year-old, rather small in stature, and absolutely compelling. So you know, thank you. Lots of other things too, but thank you. Well, and thanks for the endorsement. I've, I've actually found that I, I tend to like Nubigan better than I've liked some of the subsequent missional literature and because he's just he's he's excellent so yes please read me again <laughs> thank you yes Mark yeah thank you I, I found that very uh, very helpful and stimulating um, mm -hmm. one question I have is uh, when you bring a, a missional sense to science does that change, do you think, at all your epistemology of science? Are you, at, are you any different in the way that you are, the quickness with which you might believe a theory? Uh, you know about Michael Plani's personal knowledge, how, like, does your point on whether you throw in with the scientific community on a theory or not change at all? Or how do you think about that? That's a good question. I think, um, I think I'd go back to the the reframing of the, the narrative and how it's helpful there in that it helps us to see the integrity of creation um, itself and how, so, so when we, because sometimes when we, when we go that pre-evangelism route, sometimes science really just becomes a sort of platform uh, in which to do evangelism. And, and in worst case scenario, it's sort of an object lesson, right? Um, and, and sometimes, you know, without naming names or groups, um, sometimes that's an explicit method, right? We already know what the truth is, and science is just sort of corroborating evidence for what we already know from the Bible. Um, but I think what this narrative tells us is that actually there's this integrity to creation itself. And yes, it's fallen, so we can't just, there is the is ought problem, right? We can't just read nature and, and think, another great lesson you begin quote, right? Uh, nature has a charming smile, but her teeth are terrible. So we, we can't just look at nature and, and just extrapolate an ethics from that. Uh, but God is redeeming and he's active and there's a, there's a new creation coming. So, so that's, that's where I'd go. Like, I think it, it doesn't directly talk about this because it's not really directly in the faith and science conversation. It's more about a church conversation. But I think in reframing what mission's about to see that, that grand scape. So we, our, our doctrine of the church doesn't start with the New Testament. It goes all the way back to the beginning. It's creation itself. Right, and then all the way forward to the new creation. That, that helps me with the epistemology. Yeah. Yes? I'm not sure if I'm entirely formulated the question. I was struck in, 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 in your presentation about um, that, um, you know, that we live in this post-Christian world and that from the perspective of people who've been in the academy and particularly in science, we were sort of like leading indicators of this. Like that, that, you know, people, it became very cool to be atheists a lot earlier in, in that, you know, community uh, than, it, than it was in a broader society. Um, do you think that, um, that we possibly have then maybe learned a little bit more than, than the church at large because of that? Or, or that maybe we have... Uh, not lived up to what what we what we might have, and you know, mm -hmm. 
if there's any sociological learnings to that, it's important from our local churches, or that sometimes that is difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I, it could be really different in different places. I think I think you're well aware is what you're saying of that post Christendom kind of setting, and arguably in a lot of the other disciplines that's that's more pronounced now, like probably in the humanities and social sciences, um, so like an English lit department or something. Um, things are things are very pronounced there too. But um, yeah, I, I think that, that that's an interesting conversation we need to have, and I wonder sometimes if. The, the, the trouble people run into is this is what they're facing. And if the only way we engage people in Christian communities is by trying to get them to church, where do we get active in that? How does that work? So, yeah, I think ongoing conversation around that and ideas about what, you know, what that's led to. Uh, insights, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, I don't want to speak for people, but that wouldn't surprise me. Yes. Can I come back a little bit more to what she was saying? Sure. Um, I think, in my experience, the most challenging is being in the community because pretty much I'm the only Christian in, in, in my department, and most of my job precludes lots of other interactions. So that's a real challenge. And, uh, I'm waiting to hear someone else's wisdom on that, because I haven't got it. What I find is open, and I think it's what you're saying, is um, I'm very blatant about what I do and what I say about my attitude, let's say, to graduate students, which is a big part of my job. My job is to build them up and, you know, like a bird, set them loose to fly. And... The impression I get is that doesn't make a difference. The one young lady was just telling me how she's really happy. Fabulous. So I was just basically then saying my <coughs> philosophy is I want people to be happy because then they're going to be more creative. If I whip them and bully them, they may work harder, but they won't be creative. Yes, yes. Yeah, and those opportunities are Yeah. I didn't preach the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> but participating in God's mission on that level, that forms who you are as a person and how you engage. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows, at, at times it could raise an opportunity. Somebody may say, why on earth are you like this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm and the thing I like about the missional switch with the framework is, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, because it matters, but in another way, because you're pursuing that ultimate end, which is they're flourishing under God, whether they know what the source of that is or not, you're still pursuing that end, right? And so it's, it's not like a lesser thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to... Yeah. So I, I suspect there's quite a few uh, Redeemer faculty here. So being at a, or, and others who are at other uh, institutions, but being at a Christian institution, I wonder if that gives a different perspective on what you were talking about. You almost you don't have to really work too hard at the community because you're in it. Um, I might be wrong, but I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, that's what came to my mind. It's a lot easier to have a sense of community here. For sure. Uh, yeah, you're one faculty in the department. You know, we have we have common mission and visions. It's great. The downside is we're a little bubbleish, right? So uh, yeah, uh, raise not, not entirely. I mean, I mean, we're doing research with colleagues, with our students are uh, are interacting other places, but that, that's the the slight tendency. But they leave here and they don't stay in the bubble. They're being formed and shaped in a different way. Yeah, so it's a context in which you're personal faith and faith amongst faculty can thrive and be strengthened. But maybe also what then is the missional purpose of Redeemer or of the institution in a broader sense? Like how, not just individually in settings, but 
as an institution, is there a sense in which being salt and light, being transformative, as well as an expression by being very intentional as being a Christian university? So it has a whole different purpose. Mm -hmm. It's simply adapting, accommodating, surviving in a hostile secular environment where you're trying to thrive in a Christian environment, take that back into the secular world. Yeah, so I would say, like, you know, what you said here is kind of consistent with what we're trying to teach our students. Like <coughs> pursuing science for the sake of science and covering God's world, not to be some sort of bait and switch on this humanity. That never crosses my mind even talk like that here. It's more, much more of this kind of holistic thing that you're trying to say here. And I hope our students get it. I hope our students go out to be scientists who think that way as well. Were you on our yesterday? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, I'm at Trinity Western. Uh, Mark is at Trinity Western yeah. uh, as well, and, and we're different, I think, than than Reimer in some ways. We're probably not as dominantly Christian among the student body. We have uh, a number of students definitely who are not Christians, but um, like the idea of studying at a small private institution. Um, and I think one of the things we try to do is model for our students what it is to be scientists and to bring them along to uh, to experience uh, science in ways that maybe they didn't expect from their uh, perhaps more fundamentalist uh, Christian backgrounds. I mean, we do have students from those backgrounds um, to open up to them the idea that, well, if you're, a, if you're a Christian in the sciences, that doesn't mean that you have to um, you know, just go and do mercy ships work. Um, but, you know, whatever whatever uh, you're interested in, whatever you're curious about, um, you know, God has given you those uh, gifts and, and those uh, experiences, and and um, you can use those to uh, to advance his kingdom in, in, in ways that you might not have expected from your uh, Christian families or churches. And then also for the students who aren't Christians, just to show them hospitality, uh, to to their own curiosity about how come how can you be a scientist and a Christian at the same time? That doesn't make sense for some uh, some of our students, uh, especially if they're not of a Christian background. Um, and so to model that to, to them uh, to to be to be you know um, diligent about answering their questions in ways that show that you're really listening to what they're they're saying. Um, so. Uh, we, we have a course uh, that our fourth year science students take. It's, it's uh, Christian worldview in the natural sciences. Um, and Mark has helped teach that course in the past as well. Um, and uh, some of our best students are actually students who are not Christians um, because they have to actually read the literature about what it is, what scientists or Christians say. And they, they start to learn those things. Whereas if you're, if you're already a Christian, you might just sort of have a gut feeling of what uh, scientists or Christians ought to say, and so you speak on that without without really getting into the academic literature. So those are some reflections from Trinity Western from my <laughs> vantage point there. Patrick, what has been, if you don't mind me asking, your experience <clears throat> uh, having graduated from Kindle, but then having taught at Providence for six years and and then back. At Tyndall, in the middle of well, not quite in the middle of Toronto, but in the certainly in the heart of the GTA. Uh, in terms of this, what what we are discussing here about context and uh, 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 what kind of differences are you picking up, or are you? Uh, yeah, so I'm from Southern Ontario originally, and I spent uh, the last six years teaching out in Southern Manitoba, and it's a very very different context. Um, I was just uh, telling somebody earlier today that one of my memories out there was I spoke at an event uh, maybe two years ago and it was in Morden um, at the Discover Fossil Center in Morden. Uh, Manitoba is a gem for fossils because the whole thing used to be underwater and they have these two full massasaur skeletons, the size of a bus, these ancient predators, right? Just incredible. But the surrounding town kind of thinks it's a hoax. And, uh, and so uh, I, I gave a lecture, it was just a basic faith and science kind of a lecture. And, and the entire Q&A was on evolution and origins, even though I didn't bring it up at all. Uh, so that was a very different setting. So for there, um, I was really seeing the dichotomy of the church was in sort of cloister mode. 
So it was, it was not missionally engaged. It was in protection mode, self-protection mode. Um, and you see this with, um, again, it's always hard to mention organization names, but you see this with, with some of the Young Earth Creation organizations who, who have this real sense that the world's going downhill and our young people are going to le be led astray. So we need to teach them, you know, this, this biblical view of creation that's going to save them. And so it's a bit of a hunker down mentality. But again, it's in a very Christianized subculture in which there really aren't those challenges often. So you can kind of maintain that in that kind of a place. So I, I found myself, actually, I was sort of a missionary <laughs> in the other direction in that context. And so for me, it was the, the whole thing about sensitivity became very big. You know, you, you, you can never expect to move somebody from here to here. You know, you go in, you establish relationship and you kind of, you kind of over the course of a few years. And so I had a couple pastors that I had relationships with. And over the course of six years, we did five or six things at their churches and there was real movement that began to happen, but it was through that building of trust, right? And, and, and not just going for the, the, you know, the, the deep end right from the beginning, but, but really walking along. So it kind of works. It's almost like, you know what, it, it, a lot of it comes down to being who Christ has called us to be, having integrity in both spheres and being sensitive to the setting. And um, so now in Toronto, uh, again, it's very different coming back to Tyndale, especially being in a place where we're all our, when we're talking missional, we're talking intergenerational, intercultural, um, we're, we're talking a place where, you know, you can't just build a church because there's no space, there's no zoning, the challenges are bigger. So the missional conversation becomes that much more important in a setting where, you know, the, the church is very much on the margins and we got to be out there. So, yeah. So I think how do you establish community in those kinds of places is, a, is the challenge. Okay, thank you again, Patrick.